it's the next level. Panelers, welcome to the show. I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And welcome back, Daphne. This is a Snowpiercer, a first, the, ah, I can't talk tonight. This has been, a, <laughs> it's been a day, let me tell you. Uh, we are, we are about, we are restarting our Snowpiercer coverage. This is uh, going to be a spoiler for a podcast of the first episode of Snowpiercer season three, episode one. First episode. I, I like to repeat myself, so. But before we before we get started, Daphne, with with our discussion of the first episode of season three, let's talk a little bit about where where we left off. Now, I I got a chance to watch the, the last two episodes of season two again, so I I kind of got my headspace uh, into kind of where we're at. Um, and there was one quote that really stood out to me. I don't remember if we mentioned this in the podcast last time. Probably did because it seems like a, a quote that I would remember is when Alex is talking about the train, the, the Snowpiercer that was under Melanie's control and under Leighton's control. She talks about the fact that freedom has to be messy. And I, I thought that was a very interesting, interesting quote um, at the beginning of, of uh, episode 10 of season two. Uh, so we have the aquarium train, which was used to basically uh, breach the, the, the train and separate the Snowpiercer engine from the Snowpiercer, the Big Alice engine, which is pushing Snowpiercer. Yes, that would be correct. And so we, we at first I thought we had about a 10 car pirate train, but we were discussing before we started recording that actually it's more like seven cars if you try to count. Uh, yeah. So we, we lost a, a couple of cars in there or two or three cars uh, in this this whole thing. Um we we find out that uh, Leighton and Alex they discover that Melanie had uh, uh, preserved the data from the recording, but we don't know where Melanie is. And um, we have Josie. I, I was going through it before we started recording. We have Leighton, Josie, Alex, Ben, and Till. Those are basically our our protagonists. That's Team Leighton on on the pirate train. And then we have Audrey, the girl brakeman, Sykes. and. Sykes, is that an it? Sykes? Yep, okay. Sykes. Um, and this new character, who's not actually a new character that we're no. going to discuss uh, <laughs> later Martin. on, of Martin. Yeah, who, who the heck is Martin? <laughs> yeah, and it seems like I would go Team Audrey is Audrey and Martin and Sykes, because I think the, the, the impression I got was that they locked her in the, the library train and left her back there. They did. She wasn't, she didn't seem real down to go on... Audrey's little mission to take over the train. Yeah. So I think she's kind of team Leighton or she might be team cover my own ass. I'm not really sure. <laughs> so we'll see what, we'll see how it turns out with that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, what else? Uh, the, the one thing that I did find interesting and we'll talk about hope in this first episode, because there was a lot about hope in this first episode, but in the second to the last episode of season two, Leighton begins the episode, in my opinion, when I watched, rewatched it, he's very down. Like, he's really depressed. He's in that compost car. He's shoveling crap. You know, he's getting fed through a little slot. But by the end of that episode, as soon as he finds out that Melanie is alive, as far as they know, or at one point was alive, <laughs> um, yeah. he, he changes his tune completely. He tells Till, we're going to take back our train. And I, so I, I absolutely loved that. And I loved how that was going into season three. Yes. What about you? Any other thoughts on season one or season two? Well, I think Boki and Josie were like the heroes of episode 10 because they were the ones who actually separated the front of Snowpiercer. And let's, I think we have to set some ground guidelines from the beginning that we have Big Alice and Snowpiercer. And when we talk about mm. Big Alice, we're talking about Big Alice and is it 1,023 cars? Right. When we talk about Snowpiercer, we're talking about Snowpiercer and seven cars. 
Okay. That is the separation between the two. We may have okay. to repeat like this that. a few times, but I think that we kind of have to set those, you know, not rules, but those general thoughts in place because mm-hmm. it could get very confusing. Yeah, because even in the episode, they kept calling both trains Snowpiercer. Yes. Is, and that was that was a little confusing for me, uh, so I, I totally agree. Um, but we'll talk a little. We may talk a little bit about that because the title of the episode uh, kind of establishes what we're what we're looking at and what uh, what kind of things. We, and I didn't have anything in my notes, but maybe you do about the whole. Uh, how did he put it? Uh, Big Alice is a slow moving. Oh, I uh, wrote the entire speech oh, down. Oh, good. Okay, you got it. Because so. I loved it. I thought that opening was great. But we'll get to that once we get into. We'll get notes. to that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's let's remind everybody once again. If you have not watched uh, for the first episode of season three of Snowpiercer, I don't know why you'd be listening to us if you hadn't. But if you haven't, you need to stop <laughs> now. Go back, watch the first episode of season three, and and then come back to us, and we'll have our our nice discussion of it. Uh, but we do have a, an episode synopsis. The title of the episode was The Tortoise and the Hare. This is all according to IMDb, by the way. So something changes. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, and it just gives a little synopsis of while Wilford emphasizes his rule aboard his icy train, Leighton's pirate train continues its dangerous quest for warm spots and comes across something entirely unexpected. I think that's a decent synopsis. I think so. I, I I like the the shorter ones that don't give a lot away. That just kind of tell you here's here's what it's about. Now go watch it. You know. Yeah. I liked this episode overall. I had a few questions at the end, and I thought about one thing I really loved right off the bat was the opening where they're showing the track and how it runs throughout the world, and then also included in that is this hope about this tree, which we. It was alluded to. We saw Leighton kind of having these visions of this tree. Mm -hmm. I think that tree represents hope and I'm going to stick to it and we will see, you know, where it takes us this season. But I loved the analogy of the tortoise and the hare because you have to imagine that Big Alice and all of those cars are a heck of a lot slower than Snowpiercer and her seven cars. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we, we get that even in that the, throughout the episode where they're talking about how it's, how hot it's running and uh, what was it? I didn't write it down, but the one where, where, how are we doing Alex? And she's, well, we're not on fire. So, <laughs> you know, that says a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. I kind of like that. Um, well, yeah, I loved it as well. I have, I'm along with you. I have a few couple of, of things that I was a little, uh, not, Disappointed is is too strong of a word. Uh, I'm unsettled about. Okay. And and I'll get into that when we get into our our top five highlights. Okay. Uh, but I did love. There's a lot of things that are set up for this this season. And uh, I watched the trailer for the next episode. Me too. So, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm excited to see where that where that's going to take us. I kind of wanted to know. Like overall, every season has been building towards this one and i feel like the theme for this one is kind of a a war with mm-hmm. hope and the potential for their lives changing forever yeah and i feel like that has been on we've been on the cusp of that i think in the first season it was you know the battle of who's going to prevail on the train is it going to be first class or the tailies Then last season, we saw a wonderful Wilford return, and we've learned how sadistic he is. So it became the battle for the train between Leighton and his team and Mm -hmm. the wonderful Wilford, who, man, he's a piece of work. (laughs) We learned more about him, and oh, some of the things that he did last season were just incredibly brutal. And going into this season, I was already a little... (laughs) uneasy about what we might see from him this time Mm -hmm. um but then this season i feel like it's not just about the train it's about the future and hope for the future and how they can get hope for everyone that's on the train not just you know the few people that are on snowpiercer 
Yeah, I think it's going to be the battle. You know, what's it? It's always talked about in different movies. It's it's hearts and minds. It's going to mm-hmm. be the the battle is is there. We've got to get their heart and we've got to get their mind. But but I think like like you said, I think what we're going to see is. Wilford is going to be the the control the controlling kind of kind of stamp out hope that no we need to stay on the train and stay moving and Layton's group is going to be the ones that no we're hopeful that the world is returning to to something at least like it used to be and and we want to see where that goes. Yes, and I remember last year on the podcast we talked about the fact that Wil- Wilford really wants to keep everyone on the train because it's an environment that he can control and where he has power and we know he's obsessed with power exactly so with that why don't we get into uh, our discussion points and as i have been i was raised a gentleman and i will always be a gentleman (laughs) i always let the lady go first well i wanted to go back to the starting point and revisit the opening monologue that we got from layton Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to read that real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's basically two trains, two chapters to tell. One runs hot and fast, the other lumbers slow. Cold cast in Wilford's iron grip. An armored tortoise plodding after a hare. Everyone under a single thumb serving a single obsession to retake the pirates and exact his revenge. Inside, it's a backwards world. Only one class now, the working class. Freezing, stitching, fixing, suffering. But frostbitten fingers hold fast, deep in the iced over bowels, where Wilford never treads. A spark still lives, the resistance, the nurtured and protected by the bravest of the brave. The heart of hope still beats aboard Wilford's rolling gulag, 1,023 cars long. I think the heart of hope still beats aboard Wilford's rolling gulag may be one of my favorite quotes or pieces from opening monologues from the entire series. Because I think yeah. that's what is representative because we see that during this monologue, we see how very different life is on Snowpiercer or Big Atlas's Snowpiercer. Mm -hmm. than it used to be when they had the first class cabins and everything was bright and beautiful at the front. We're not seeing that. It's very dark. Yeah, I was, this was somewhere within my notes and I can't remember exactly where, where it was. Um, But it was interesting to see that the fact that, that Big Alice has become, basically you have Wilford and Javi, uh, who Javi, Javi alive, I was so Bobby. thankful. <laughs> uh, uh, we'll get to Javi that later. <laughs> okay. All right. So we got Ben and Javi. Um, and uh, and who's with him in the engine? The dog. Kevin. The do- and Kevin. And dog. And, then, oh, and Kevin goes Kevin. back and forth. Yeah. Kevin kind of goes back and forth um, between the engine. And it, it, it kept confusing me. The geography kept confusing me a little bit until I realized that, oh, wait, this is Big Alice pushing yes. the train. So first class is all the way up at the front. Yes. Of, of Big Alice now. It's shut down. It's all icy it's and cold. very cold. <laughs> very cold. And then you have the the, the second class or, or wherever the, the rest of the refugees, 2,700 people are living uh, in all the rest of the cars that still remain. And they're continuing, they, you know, they're, they're cold. There's some of them are, are getting frostbitten. You know, there's one point where Kevin talks about a culling and Ruth is, or not Ruth, um, uh, Zara. Zara. Zara is like, no, you can't, you can't do that. So that's the other one we have is Zara. And then we have the doctors. So these yes. are all the ones that are basically in the, the big Alice engine that yes. have the, maybe you're living a, at least a better life. Yeah. Than what, there's comfort there. There's comfort there. And then I, I loved you. I got chills when you read that, that monologue again, because I started imagining Ruth is that metaphorical beating heart yes she that's is in the coldest part of the train with this little space heater and her warm heart and she's staring out the, the the porthole there at the end and just and just looking at everything and i just i just love ruth so much i love the actress that plays her and uh can't talk enough about her so that's that's excellent excellent i really like that too i like that she she is the resistance she is the spark 
for the resistance. And who else would be her second in command but the unpredictable Pike? Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I've got some more about that in my next point, but I, I wanted to start off with my first point uh, with what I was unsettled or disappointed about. And that was the ambiguousness of Melanie's status. I am so <laughs> upset that we didn't even get anything from her. And I'm, I'm torn because like part of me, I want to know what's happening with her. But then I also know that the show is going to slowly dole out to us, you know, what's happening uh, with her. And we had, you know, we had several episodes in the last season where we never even saw her. And then yes. we had one episode that was all about her, you know. Um, and so I just, I was just like, ah, I was kept going back and forth during the episode. Going, Are we going to see her? And then when it ended and we didn't, I was just like, ah. Uh, yeah, come on, Steve. You didn't really think they were going to give us Melanie right away, did you? I hoped. <laughs> I had hope. <laughs> well, hope is a wonderful thing, but I don't think we're going to see her just yet. I think yeah. it sounds like something we might see around maybe episode five or six. And not That's because I've, yeah, not because I've read anything, but just because knowing TV and how they like to tell the story... And this show in particular, I didn't think that we would see her. I was kind yeah. of hopeful that we might get like some, I don't know, some scene at the end of the episode that was kind of her in a bed waking up or something. I don't know, something. <laughs> we didn't get it, but I'm okay with it because I I feel like the people that put this show together know how to tell the story. So I'm putting a lot of faith in them to continue yeah. to tell it right well and they've given us they've given us something though that gives us a spark of hope that she is alive is the fact that we have this introduction of this new character who apparently has been living not on the train has been living in this whatever this facility was in north korea for the entire time so yeah. that we have that yeah it was kind of like a bunker mm -hmm. but it wasn't a bunker it was just I mean, Ben fell into it. He just kind of fell yeah. upon it into this big hole. Um, he created this big hole when he, yeah, he just fell when he was collecting those samples. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that new character is played, if I'm not mistaken, by Archie Punjabi, who is mm -hmm. a wonderful actress. And I'm super excited that she's going to be part of the show and can't wait to see what her character brings us for information. Yeah, I know we had that announcement last year before we, we finished up the, the, the podcast that she was joining the, the, the cast. And we kind of speculated maybe she was going to be the one to rescue Melanie. Well, maybe not. Maybe so. Maybe Melanie's deeper in that bunker. I don't I don't remember <laughs> where Melanie's – no, her station was like in the Rockies or something like yeah. that, right? In Colorado. Yeah, she's so, far yeah. from here. But I'm yeah. thinking maybe this person, what I'm hoping for, is that her character is someone who's connected through mm -hmm. radio with others. Right. But I guess, you know, we're going to have to be patient. And sometimes I'm just not that patient. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> so what is your next one? My next one, I want to talk a little bit about the symbolism of the music in this episode. Because we get at the begin near the beginning we have miss gilly singing with the students the song morning town ride and then it transitions from her playing the ukulele and singing into oz playing the piano in the night car which doesn't look quite as elaborate and beautiful as it used to and so i really enjoyed how that all wove together um, we also got a string quartet in A major, Opus 2, which is by Strauss, that took place during a scene that was between Audrey and Sykes. But the one that I felt was the most impactful is the Dinah Washington song, This Bitter Earth. And that is what took us at the end of the episode for just going out into the end. We see Javi is sitting at his post, the dog is ugh, ready. I mean, oh. Javi must be, I mean, he's traumatized, but we will get to that. But Jupiter is just sitting there 
And you get the feeling that Jupiter is only there to keep Javi in line. I mean, it looks like Javi doesn't dare to move. But we have mm -hmm. Javi, then we transition into LJ and Oz in the night car, which whoever thought those two would be running the night car? Audrey, when if she ever gets back to it, is oh, she may not be pleased. Um, the terrible public defiling that happened for the two folks that took a bath. Mm -hmm. Then we get Wilford at Josie's sonogram, which scares me because he's just so sadistic. Then we get the scene that you were talking about with Ruth looking out the window. And it ends with Leighton kind of having these visions of the tree and the Snowpiercer side. So... I just felt, you know, the words, this bitter earth, well, what a fruit it bears, what good is love that no one shares. There's another part a little bit later. Oh, this bitter earth. Yes, it can be so cold or, um, oh, this bitter earth. Yes. Can it be so cold today? You're young too soon. You're old. And I just think that it really, it's representative of this show in so many ways. And I'm glad that they picked it because I think it had a lot of impact. Yeah. At the end. And the Morningtown ride that we had at the beginning is when we saw Winnipeg. She mm -hmm. is still the stealth little messenger girl that yeah. we have seen. And she's still like right in it, you know, taking messages to everyone. I love that when she runs through the night car and, and LJ is like, this is not a pass through. <laughs> you know, <laughs> She just doesn't care. She's going to no. go wherever she wants to go. Nobody's going to stop her. And we get that vision of of her, where how she gets there, how she actually gets to Ruth. And all of this weird, like how hidden Ruth truly is. They're just keeping her secluded and safe. Like she is the spark and they have to keep her safe from Wilfred. But yet I don't think he knows it's her. I don't think he knows I, that she's leading it. I am, I'm totally convinced he has no clue that she is on the train because yeah. if he knew, if he knew she was on the train, he would turn everything over to find her. Yes, he would. To, to, to get her. There would be, so I'm, I'm convinced that he has no clue uh, that she's there at all. Yeah. I think Pike is keeping her safe. I think that's one of his focal points is making sure Ruth stays hidden, stays safe the whole nine yards. I, I love that we got Stephen Ogg back. As, yes. <laughs> as Pike. He's, he's so incredible and he's just, he, he plays so well that line between whether he's for Wilford or whether he's the resistance, yeah. you know, and, and Wilford doesn't realize, or Kevin probably doesn't realize that he's resistance. And yet he's, he's the one who's, who's making sure Ruth gets deeper into the train where she can hide out and he's mm -hmm. got a little space heater there. And oh I, my goodness. The little comment he made, I, I, I had to roll this back <laughs> several times. And then I finally had to look it up when he, he says something about a whippet. He, yes. he says, and I had no clue. I, I mean, I knew it was something. It's uh, a dog. A whippet is a, a little dog. It's like a, um, it has a similar body type to a greyhound, only it's smaller. <laughs> And it's, it's UK. It's a UK. Yes. Uh, uh, basically, th that's where they are mostly at. Uh, yes. So I, I thought it was really, really cool. Just and I, like I said, I had to look it up and, and understand what that whole exchange meant. But uh, it's just it's they're so cute. Those two. And I, I, I don't, I'm not saying I want something romantic to happen between the two of them, but it would be in incredibly cute if something did. Uh, I like them as a tandem. I think they're a good team together. And he, like you said, I think he's done a great job of. Just kind of not lying low, but keeping Wilford doing what he has to do so Wilford doesn't really know just how mm -hmm. ingrained in the resistance he really is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of where where my next point kind of goes. I already kind of started to talk about hope, uh, but there's a lot of hope in this in this episode. I, I, and I loved hearing all the different characters interact with each other. You know, Ruth, she still has the hope for Leighton's return. That's what she tells Pike. We're all waiting for uh, for Leighton's return. Pike has that same hope because he's part of the resistance. He wouldn't be part of the resistance if he didn't have some kind of hope. Cause we know Pike in the first season, Pike was really a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in the second season when they convince him to, to, to help out and he ends up in a drawer, you know, and now we see him full blown. He's in the resistance. Yes, he is. You know, um, 
I love that mate that Leighton is maintaining his hope that Melanie is out there. And even though Audrey, you know, Audrey's kind of trying to pick at Alex and, and take that hope away, but it's Till. Till is the one who convinces Alex that there's still hope, which yes. I thought was was incredible. Um and that tree, that tree, as you talked about before, I, I'm right there with you. I believe that tree is the metaphor for that hope, for that life, for that life coming back. Um, yes. And, you know. We haven't mentioned either that this took place all six months after the train split. So there was a bit of a time jump. And if, yeah, you, if you didn't realize it, you would see it in one particular character. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I caught that in the very first watch when I saw the six months, months later, I was like, okay, so we've had six months of them running and Wilford chasing them yes. around the globe, you know, and they're looking for these hot spots. And, and I'm not sure if Till really believes that there's hot spots or at least she wants to believe. Yes. But she's definitely right there with Alex and she, she knows that Alex is the one that needs to keep that hope alive yes. sort of thing. Um, and then finally Bennett, uh, just having a hope that the pirate train is going to be maintained. You know, he's outside the train and Alex is like, no, we need to go. And then it's like, no, no, it'll be fine. You know, yeah. it'll, and, and I just love that, that, that back and forth of those, two, the two engineers, uh, there, yes. cause we saw, it was one of the scenes in, um, it's between her and is it between her and Ben or is it hot? I think it's, it must be Ben, uh, in episode 10 I think where she puts her hand on the the engine and she says something about it and Ben says your mom used to do that would touch the engine yes and I thought was it Ben or Wilford it was either it was it was one of them Ben or Wilford said that to her like your mom used to do that because she actually had shown she had shown Alex that you know how to understand the train and that was one of the things that she Mm -hmm. showed her I think we also got to see a bit about Alex. She wasn't quite as confident in this episode. I think she needed a bit of reassurance and she trusted Ben to kind of be the the train guru and without him and realizing that she might have to step up, mm-hmm. she got a little doubtful of herself and Till was right there to just be, I'm here to do whatever you need me to do. We're going to do this. It's going to be okay. Yeah, I loved it when she when she told Till you're gonna have to pilot the 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 the, the engine, and Till's like me, you know. Yeah. She's like, well, yeah, you're the only. There's only the two of us here, you know. <laughs> so, and then she puts her in the Among Us. I'm getting Among Us PTSD flashbacks <laughs> when she's telling Till connect the blue to the blue, the red to the red. I'm like, no. <laughs> that is very Among Us. <laughs> yes, you're right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I I really I just really like that hope, and I I, I I'm. Hoping we're going to keep getting that uh, yeah, throughout the season. Me so. too. So we can move on to my next point, which is Javi is alive. Oh my God. <laughs> Ugh, I was hoping was for it? it. I was so hoping for it when the episode started and there was someone sitting at the back of the train with a big old parka on. I'm just mm-hmm. thinking, oh my gosh, it could be Javi. Is Javi alive? Because I already was mourning, you know, we lost a few characters last season. It was real rough. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was just hoping. And so the fact is, Javi is alive. But the Javi that we saw, I'm just not... I feel like he's just been beaten down and defeated. And he's being guarded by Jupiter. And he's not allowed to move. And Wilford was super creepy with him a few times, <laughs> oh. putting the cream on his scars and telling him that he needs him. And then he says, when you're one man responsible for nearly 3,000, it's not enough to be the disciplinarian. You need to add a little chaos to the mix. Out there, it's Kevin. In here, it's Jupiter. You can't fight the unpredictable, Javier. That's how I keep everyone safe. And then after that, he says to him, I need you. And I'm just like, oh, what do you need him for? I'm scared. I mean, we all know when you needed Kevin, what you did to him. And now Mm -hmm. Kevin is sadistic as well and so creepy. The scenes of him walking through the train, leading all of his officers with him was just, 
oh, it's very unsettling. And I'm worried. I'm worried for our friends who are aboard Big Alice's Snowpiercer because can't yeah. trust anyone. I mean, we saw what Kevin. happened to a few people and yeah, not good. Oh, that when, when he when he finds the the second class uh water, you know, water uh guy and he's like you smell clean. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and and the woman there and and we know that she got the bath token actually from Pike. Yes, but, but she but didn't Pike, give him up. No, no, and that was that was good and so uh yeah, um Let's see. My next one we've really already talked about. Um, let me see if there's anything in there that... Uh, uh, yeah, my next one we've already kind of talked about. Wilford's one-class train with L.J. Oz. And I forgot about Jack Boot Wiz, uh, Wiggins. They're living in the in the, the night car. And then Kevin and Mr. Wilford in the engine with Javi as the pilot. Um, but then we have, you know, the second class and the tailies have basically mixed together. And I forgot that we lost a bunch of first class passengers uh in that during the the rebellion we really kind of did thing. um it's rough we've lost yeah. some every season and even though one thing about snowpiercer is even though we have our main characters there are all of these other characters that are kind of auxiliary or extra kind of extra characters but they come in very handy. They do a lot of great things. And when you lose them, you you don't want to lose them because you're thinking, mm -hmm. oh, no, that's Boki. Like Boki, right. Boki's story really came to a head and losing him was a huge deal because he was so strong and they needed that strength. Mm -hmm. But he was, yeah. you know, he was so necessary when he was able yeah. To, yeah, he was able to save everyone by helping split that car. And and that was another one of those scenes in episode ten where you have the execution of the the, the people who killed the breachmen under Wilford's orders, where he brings Leighton in, he show he leaves, or Till, he brings Till in and he says, These are the men, these are the people that killed the breachmen. And and Till's like, but they did it from your, on your orders, and they had to go to trial. And he's like, no, we're just going to kill them. And then basically he just opens up the pipes and just freezes them. And you're just yeah. like, these were people who were following your orders. Yeah. You know, Roche and his family are in drawers somewhere. I know. Oh, um, and it's been six months. Yeah, so who knows what state, what state they're in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that was my number, my my number three kind of thing. We've like I said, we've already kind of talked about it. The the whole one class train and the fact that she, that Wilford doesn't know, or I, it's really surprising to me that it's almost like he doesn't even suspect that it's Ruth. And the only thing yeah. I can the reason I can think of that is he he must believe that even though he only saw uh, Leighton and maybe Bennett, or I guess he only saw Leighton when the aquarium when the, the, the breach happened, maybe he just assumes that Ruth is over there. He probably the does. I mean, no one really knows the folks that are on Snowpiercer, the seven cars, they know who's there. Cause there's only a few of them. So they know right. where everyone else is, but you also don't know. I mean, we've determined that a couple more cars got damaged or broken. Right. So we're only down to seven. So, Oh, crazy, crazy. I know, man. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your next one? Uh, my next point is Zara. I think she is in survival mode. And I think she was the biggest indication that the time has passed by because she is now much more pregnant with Leighton's mm -hmm. child. And it seems she has a role. Um, although I think Wilfred is kind of taking care of her because he realizes that he has to take care of everyone in order to keep Audrey safe on the other side. And Zara you is, you know, she's got a role to play. She's coming in and giving the update on how things are. The pipes are frozen. The ag sack output is down. And then 43 sleepers lost heat completely. You know, she's explaining all of these things. And then, you know, she tells she tells Wilford that maybe they could cut off the first class, you know, cut the first class cars loose 
and mm-hmm. he won't do it. Right. He won't do it. Because he thinks he's going to be able to bring Snowpiercer back to yes. its glory, to its, its combined everything. You the know. magic and the elaborateness of everything. He wants to get back to that. And that's at the same time that Kevin suggests calling them. And that's when, you know, Wilford's honest and said he has to keep all the passengers alive so that Audrey isn't harmed. I don't think Leighton would hurt Audrey. I don't I- think he would. Even if Wilford did something really bad, I don't think he would hurt Audrey because I think there's this piece of Leighton that, like most of us, is hoping that Audrey isn't completely gone. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm not sure. She was my favorite character for a long time on this show, and I'm now... I'm a little disappointed, I have to say. You and I kind of went back and forth. You and I kind of went back and forth about about uh, who Audrey, whether is she faking? Is she really yeah. like this or what? And we finally had to come to the conclusion that, yeah, she's back on she's Wilford's back side. On she's Team under Wilford. his spell. Yeah. yeah, she's under his spell. And it's just, uh, and Yeah, uh. it's very disappointing. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm worried about Zara, though. Because I think Wilford would take her child in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I think he looks at that child as something he can hold over Leighton's head. He looks at both of them as something that he can hold over Leighton's head. And of course he wants a protege. He wants someone to be able to, you know, leave Snowpiercer to or, you know, Mm -hmm. he wants an heir. Mm-hmm. And he what, lost Alex. He so. lost Alex. Alex was in what he didn't have enough time. He needs to have someone from birth. Mm-hmm. And he didn't get that with Alex. And now Alex has realized the truth and she wants yeah. to get her mom. So I think we're in a situation where I'm really concerned that he is going to take the baby as soon as it's born. So I just keep thinking, Zara, don't go into labor yet. <laughs> Give it, hold off yep. just a little while longer. I haven't done the math yet to determine how far along she is, but she, she's she got to be seven or eight months along at least. So Yeah, she's got to be getting close. So. She's got to be getting close. So time is of the essence here. I think Leighton knows that as well. So my next one is uh, kind of the bin rescue mission kind of thing. And it, it was one of those, I could never tell, they never... I could never read that wrist console thing. So I never really understood. I, the only one I caught was the one there at the end when Layton's was at zero. And that was in the second, the that second was, watch. I think their air or their suit pressure. Mm-hmm. I think that is what it had to do with. Yeah. And he was yeah. already low when he sent Josie back to Snowpiercer with Ben. And, and the thing that I, that kind of confused me a little bit, even on the second, did they, did they know that Ben fell into a hole or was that just, an assumption they made because of the sounds they heard. Cause they brought that very specific contraption, you know, to build and lower a, a cable down to be able to lift someone out of like a, a falling into I a hole. I think it was an assumption. Okay. I think they may have been watching him and he disappeared. And one of them may have been watching oh. him and he disappeared. And so he, you know, they assumed that okay. he was down inside. So they had to go and get him. Right. Okay. And Josie, and then, so freaking tough. Oh, so tough. I loved it that she was amazing <laughs> in this episode. Uh, because, you know, then they have to go and possibly rescue Leighton because, and look, I understand being curious about, you know, seeing this mysterious light and knowing that there's warmth. But, dude, you're in a time crunch here. Yeah, you're you know? running out of power or air. You don't have. Yeah any time to spare you need to get out of there it was just it was reckless and and then he's like shouting into the darkness and this this was another thing that kind of confused me a little bit because i've been in in mop gear and it's hard to understand and hear people and that's just a little rubber face mask this was a full-on you know headgear helmet and unless he's broadcasting outside his it's not his voice isn't going to go very far, and then the other person's got to hear him through their suit. You know, it just it, it, that whole scene. I just I had issues with. Look, he's he doesn't even know how far he's gone. He doesn't know 
if, if someone is there, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And then he gets attacked and he has to fight. He has to fight back. And then did he, was he carrying her in her suit? Mm -hmm. You know? Yes. And I'm just like, I'm just like this, this whole sequence of events to me just seemed peculiar and, and not like I had to. It was uh, reckless. It was, I think it, you were right. It's reckless because a lot of this revolution hinges on him. And if he is out of the equation, I'm not sure it succeeds. He is exactly. instrumental to getting back the complete train. He's the George I, Washington of Snowpiercer. So, yeah, and I just don't see him it succeeding without him. Yeah. And and that's what the the whole thing I had to suspend my disbelief. That's what it what it was. I had to suspend my disbelief <laughs> that he would really go through all this trouble, you know, unless maybe like he he couldn't have thought it was Melanie cuz like you said they're thousands of miles away from anywhere Melanie could be. So yeah. anyway, that that whole sequence of events and I think he was probably very surprised that there were signs of life mm -hmm. because how on earth would they survive? But then also there was blood on the wall because when I first yeah. looked at it, I thought, Oh, this is very resident evil. He's in mm -hmm. a cold, dark place and there's blood on the wall. This is kind of strange, but I also think he was probably just blown away by the fact that there were those signs of life that he'd never expected to see in a million years. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> so what is your number one? Oh my goodness it's so hard to have a number one in this because i feel like every point is number one uh -huh. um i have to go honestly with ruth as leader of the resistance if you look back at where she was at the beginning of this series and how calm and put together she was to this point where she's freezing and she's really focused on, you know, how to keep the resistance going without Leighton there, knowing that he's going to come back or believing he's going to come back. And, and that hope, too, because she even says at one point, well, if you were going to come home, this would be a great time to do it. Because she's sitting with her little space heater at minus 10 degrees, thinking, I don't know how you even go to sleep in minus 10. Um, yeah. But I just see her transformation as, I mean, I think she's my favorite character now because the transformation from where she started to where she is now, and the actress is amazing. And yes. I, I just think that she is making the most of what she can, but she's also still got that humor because going back to the joke about the Whippet, when they're rushing to get away from their first hiding place, which doesn't sound like it's their first one, it seems like they've been moving around a lot to stay mm -hmm. safe. And she says to Pike, we can't all be built like a bloody whippet. Then once they're safe, Pike actually says to her, what, you like that I'm built like a whippet? Or you likey that I'm built like a whippet? And it just made me kind of laugh. Um, another thing, when they're walking through to get to the new hiding place and they're walking through first class. So you know, it's really cold. It's that whole area where they all sat and had that meal. When Wilfred decided, you know, that Kevin was going to be his right hand guy. Uh huh. They're going through there and she actually seemed a bit bugged that Kevin hadn't cleaned things up, that he just left everything there. Yeah. It kind of made me chuckle. Yeah, I, I thank you for explaining that. I missed the earlier Whippet reference. So that's yes. why I was so confused about the second Whippet reference. Yeah, so she was the one who started it. She was the one who started it, and he just kind of continued it on. Okay, okay, yeah. got it. That's that's helpful. Um, so my, my last one, we've actually already talked all that through. Um, so I'm going to go to the character of Martin. Who we both said we were confused oh, about. I was. Can you tell I, I was, us where we've seen him before? Because evidently, yes. he has been seen before. So tell us. Yes, See, I had to where, go back to this. Where have we seen him? I had to go back to the Snowpiercer wiki, and it is in season one, episode nine. He is the one who gives them the the gun, the 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 weapon. He he gets he he helps the resistance out in some 
in some way. And I, I need to rewatch that episode to remind myself uh, how he helps out. But he's a first class passenger who um, and that's why he has that quick line about I took a nap and woke up and my husband was gone and my children are gone and I'm in this pirate train, basically. And he has apparently become the chef. Yes. Of the pirate train because he's the one <laughs> uh, inventorying the food and he's like bringing out the, the those those MRE type packets of food that he's like, this is the last Thai vegetarian and this is this and this yeah. is that. So so that's who he was. Uh, we've only seen him that one time. He's not ever been. I went and checked IMDb as well to make sure we hadn't seen him in any other episodes. But no, uh, season one, episode nine. So we didn't see him at all in season two. And okay. here we are. And I guess I didn't realize that the pirate train contains some first class. It must contain some it first does. class uh, cars. So, yes, whatever was on the other side of the aquarium. Right. So I feel that's... like I want a map of the train. Like I want to see a map of the train. I'm going to have to go online because someone is as nerdy as me and has put it together and I want to see it. They have an app. At least last season, last year, they had an app that you could actually go on your phone or on your tablet, and you could scroll through the different cars Ooh, that, we, okay. that we know of and what number car it is. And they would you would get to one car where it would go, this car hasn't been revealed yet. Like so, like, and I don't remember what car uh, the aquarium was. Like car nine. It was near the or, front. Yeah, it was. It was yeah, it was like car. 11, Nine or 10, 12, some, yeah, right yeah, in there. Yeah, some, somewhere in there was the aquarium car. And like I said, on that app, you could kind of scroll through mm -hmm. the, the the cars that had been revealed to us, like mm -hmm. where the night car was positioned. And then, and that's where, you know, you figure out that it was actually levels. And so like one car might have two or three different levels of, of things. The train's got to be ginormous. Yes, so it has to be. Remember, though, Steve, remember back when our biggest issue was Lila Folger and if she was going to get away with murder? Yes. <laughs> We've come a long, long way since then. A yeah. long way. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Do we have any notes that we haven't talked about? I've got a couple. Jack okay. Boot Wiggins. Oh, my goodness. Christian Brunn. He is Donnie from Orphan Black. It was so cool to see him pop up on this show oh goodness gracious he's old <laughs> sorry <laughs> orphan black was a long time ago not really it's been in this decade okay yeah he was he played donnie which was allison's husband in orphan black which is show i i love i need to revisit it oh again. right so good yeah Ta tatiana maslani it just a fantastic show so it was cool to see him show up in Snowpiercer, because I may have read that he was going to be on it, but I had totally forgotten. A lot happens in a year when you're waiting for another season to come out. It's true. It's true. And it's been so long since I watched Orphan Black that I uh, yeah. that I, I totally forgot who he was. So Such um, a great let's show. see. Uh, I thought, uh, <laughs> and I think for me, you mentioned Ruth is your favorite character. And I like Ruth a lot, but I think Till has kind of become... My my favorite my favorite character She's in Death. Great. Uh, you know when she gets whacked on just before she gets whacked on the head, Alex says we've got a three minute window uh, to get back, uh, and then uh, I don't know how long it actually ends up taking for them to get the train back and actually stop it. Uh, but I love that she got a die hard moment. She's crawling through <laughs> the vents, and then that moment when she pops her head down and. Uh, her hair kind of flips, flips down and, and she's upside down. Uh, it was just wild. I loved it in the way she kind of flipped down and then grabs she the wrench. She was badass in this episode. She was really badass. And I, I just, I just loved everything, everything about her. I've already talked about the moment she had there with Alex, where when, when she starts to speed up and Alex like easy, you know? Um, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, just the great, her pulling Alex back. And I've got one of her, one of her lines is one of my quotes that I've got. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I just actually just till and those moments she had in this episode were amazing. Yeah. She was fantastic in this episode. I just loved her exchanges with Alex because she kind of took on a mother role to her, like she, or a big sister. She was really trying to get Alex to believe in herself a little bit more. Because Alex mm -hmm. has always been, or most of what she knows is under Wilford. And so 
now she's got this opportunity to discover more about herself and i'm really excited to yeah. see where she goes this season yes. very very cool uh any other notes that you got i feel like we have to talk a little bit about audrey's coup that she had basically or attempted coup with martin where martin actually says well the story is you forced me to do this because i think she is convinced it's going to work and he's not so sure and sykes did not even go along with it and she was basically the head of security for wilford mm -hmm. so that tells you something i think yeah i'm i'm not sure i was a little confused about this as well is did she really think she would be able to succeed um you know maybe if she was able to convince alex maybe that was her whole plan is i'm going to convince alex that uh, she, the, the trade needs to keep going and uh oh and i want to light my joint yeah off the taser I think it was a cigarette oh, was it just a cigarette it was okay. a cigarette yeah <laughs> she'd been holding on to it for six months <laughs> it just it i i just wondered if one of those things where i went i went i don't really know if this plan was ever gonna work you yeah. know uh but but yeah, until knocking her out was great. I thought, to, you know, yeah. she just, I love, she just walks by Martin. Like she barely walks by. Just, Boom. Boom. <laughs> and, then, and then she, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah I, I loved every moment of that. Um, and we already talked a little bit about uh, uh, Josie and Layton. I forgot that they were a couple in the first season, you they know, before, were. before Zara's uh, pregnancy was revealed and before Zara, Zara was the one who left her in the freezing car, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so we, I kind of forgot about that. And they had that little moment there at the door though, where they kind of kiss and, mm -hmm. and you see that spark again of, Oh, these two were a couple. They were. So. And then he, he had a fling. It was a one night stand with Zara because I don't mm -hmm. think he ever expected he would even see her. No. Because she went to the front. Remember? People who left the tailies to go to the front were not looked at very highly by those who stayed in the mm -hmm. tail. Well, and there was a there was a stint there was a while there where I'm not sure if he knew Josie was even alive. Yeah, he didn't. You know, so uh, and I'd have to go back and rewatch those episodes to get the actual chronology of what he. But I think you're right. They had that one night stand, and uh, that's where she got pregnant. Yes. So we'd have to figure out the timeline of how long she has. Yeah, I think she should be, she's going to have that baby soon. And so okay. I, uh, Leighton, you've got to get back. Yeah. Because I just don't see, I just don't see Wilford allowing her to have that baby. And like, and be although, able to raise it or any, you know. although I do believe that due to all of the issues that they're having with food, he may keep her alive to be able to take care of the baby to breastfeed. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, he's got to, I mean, he's got to keep her in line. It's, it's going to be at least, you know, I don't know how long I don't have kids and I've never had a kid and I'm probably not ever, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what the weaning years would be or how long it would be before he could just cut her off. Yeah. It's usually a year. I think that they breastfeed. Okay. A little okay. more. It depends on the mother, I think. Okay. Some decide to go a bit longer. Uh, so do you have any quotes that you want to share that you haven't already shared? Um, I have I have a couple. I've shared so many of them already. Uh, one is Audrey giving Sykes a chance to join her. She basically says, last chance, get back with Wilford or dig a grave with Leighton. And I'm just like, I'll dig a grave with Leighton. Yeah. <laughs> and Sykes... As we know, Sykes decides to, to be put in the cage. And then the other one that I liked was basically an exchange between Leighton and Josie, where Leighton says, you know, one time, just for a change of pace, you could respect the chain of command. <laughs> and Josie's like, chain of command? Leighton, this isn't a battleship. It's a bloody life raft. And I, I mean, little Snowpiercer is a beacon of hope. It is... It represents the opportunity for something so much more than staying on a moving metal freezing train. <laughs> you know, right. having an yeah. opportunity to find a place that might be thawing out. 
Yeah. Which we know um, Wilfred's not going to do. I've got a couple. Uh, there's a, the exchange between Till and Alex, again, where she's kind of encouraging her. And uh, Till says, well, what would Ben do? And Alex says, grab a pen and paper and start mansplaining. Yes. So I, I found really, that funny, I, too. Rowan Blanchard just continues to just she nail really it is every really good. time. She just does. I mean, she's fantastic. And, and then the other one I've got uh, from Till is where, again, where uh, Alex kind of says something about what if Wilford is right. And Till says he's not. Melanie is. We can get through this, Alex. Don't tip it the wrong way. And and again, I just I keep falling back to things that Till said that I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. Till, she's definitely one of my favorites. She's not my favorite, but she's up there. She's yeah. grown on me since we first met her in season one. Very cool. Uh, so we got a little bit of, fa- uh, of, of feedback here. Uh, do you want to take that first one from Facebook? Of course. This one's from Christy. She says, wow, a lot happened in this first episode. Super excited to see where this season goes. Hi, Christy. Thank you for your feedback. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then the other piece of feedback we got was on Instagram uh, from KT1AO. Uh, I didn't get a chance to click on the account and see if there was a name established with it, but uh, uh, KT1AO just says, loved, loved, loved it. I've been waiting for it for so long. I know. In some ways, it feels like no time has passed. Like we're only like a couple months. And then in other, other times, it feels like it's been forever. But I think that is because we got seasons one and two very close together. And yeah. then we really had to wait quite a while for this season. I mean, it, it, it was a year later. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, but it's good. We got 10, 10 episodes, I'm assuming. I haven't looked at. Yes, we have 10. We have 10 episodes. Super excited. Very, very cool. Yes. So please uh, continue on with us. Let's see. Uh, I didn't see any other uh, feedback or anywhere else. I did not get a chance to dig into any news on Snowpiercer this week. I may try, or last week, I may try this week to see if there's anything out there non-spoilery uh, related uh, that's out there. But uh, um, so as we're winding down, uh, the one of the last things we like to do here on Panels to Pixels is give some podcast recommendations. So I have one that I've, I just started and uh, I, I realize that everybody is probably sick of them by now, but uh, these rewatch podcast shows, uh, I love some of them. Some of them are a little more than I can take, but uh, they just started one uh, called Welcome to Our Show. And it is a new girl rewatch podcast with Zoe Deschanel, Hannah Simone, and Lamorne Morris. And it's delightful. I've listened to about half of the first episode on the pilot and it's uh, delightful those three you can tell that they are friends and they talk about how their friendship uh, sparked up and and how even in the audition process when they saw each other uh, they were excited so that is awesome you know steve i have not had a lot of time to listen to podcasts as much because i'm in a book club and we're doing salem's lot which is stephen king salem's lot um but I'm also, I've been podcasting a bit more than usual, so I haven't had as much time to listen to podcasts. I've been able to keep up on a few, but it's been, I haven't got anything new. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, at the end of this, we'll push your podcast and let people know where they can hear you uh, out there. So um, as we say every week, the boilerplate stuff that I that I repeat almost every show, I think, is uh, just normal stuff. Uh, you're listening to us on your podcast player of choice. But whatever podcast player of choice you have, whether it's Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or any of the ones that are out there, I know there's a bunch of them out there. If you can give us a review, a review we would love to have that uh, if available, and we'll read those if we get notified of those. Uh, we, have a, we have a Facebook page, which is panels to pixels dot... Uh, which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. We are on Twitter at panels to pixels. That's panels to pixels, the number two, uh, and then uh, pixels. Uh, we are on Instagram as well. And our Instagram is panels to pixels podcast. It's all spelled out in letters. We have an email address, which is panels to pixels one at gmail.com. And we do have a website panels to pixels podcast.com. I'm not sure 
where that's at in construction at the moment. I haven't checked it lately. I know Mark was working on it. So, um, but if you go to panels to pixels, podcast.com, it will either, it may redirect you to our Facebook page and you can leave us feedback there. And we, as we always like to do, check out all the podcasts on the next level online podcast network. You can go to next level radio online.com to see all of those. Um, next week. Episode two. Yes. Of Snowpiercer season three. Have you looked at the title for that episode? I have not. What is the title? The title is The Last to Go. Yeah. I'm not I sure don't, what that means. <laughs> I don't know either. And I don't know if the trailer that they showed at the end of the episode was for the entire season or just the next episode. I think so the not, trailer was for the whole season because for the whole season. this episode I'm checking on IMDb and it's got a synopsis. Uh-huh. So it's coming um, next. Yeah, we'll see it. And the thing is, too, Snowpiercer changed its day of the week because it used to be on Sundays and now it's on Mondays. Yes. I would have missed it if we hadn't had a conversation because I don't watch a lot of uh, regular TV anymore. I'm mostly watching cable stations or streaming, yeah. so I would have missed it. Yeah, so I'm glad we, we had that talk last week and I was able to tell you, no, no, it's Monday and we've got to do this <laughs> on Tuesday. So, yeah. so listeners out there, if you want to give us, give us feedback, I think our normal schedule we're going to try to do is 6 o'clock Central Time. That's 7 o'clock Eastern Time on Tuesday after the show airs on Monday, we will be recording our podcast. So if you can get your uh, feedback in, in that 24 hour period or so, that would be excellent. But if you can't, we'll always read anything about the, the season uh, on any episode. As we go. Well, Daphne, it's come to that time. Yes. Where can our listeners hear you? Okay. Besides here. I am still over on Run For Your Lives podcast. Uh, recording with my friend Paik. We are still covering monsters, creatures, disasters, a bit of horror. The podcast has really grown. We're almost to the end of season three, so season four will be starting in the spring. And um, yeah, this week we posted an episode on the film Reign of Fire. That was last week, and this week we're covering antlers, so that will be out on Friday. And then, antlers, I'll yeah. have to check that out. Yeah, it's a creepy one, Steve. I'll um, have to see what I can do. You know, I, I'm busy myself <laughs> podcasting <laughs> and uh, trying to, to catch up on, on some shows, but uh, our friends over at House Podcastica are, should be wrapping up Cobra Kai this yeah. week. Um, and then I'm going to still got Book of Boba Fett going over there on House Podcastica. So yeah, we uh, wrapped up Yellow Jackets last week. Yes, you did an amazing job with with Yellow Jackets in that season, and so much fun, such a deep show, and it's fun to podcast about shows that have something below the surface level. Mm -hmm. That I think Absolutely. makes a difference, and Yellow Jackets is definitely that. I like shows where I have to figure something out. It just, it makes me excited to watch the next episode. And Snowpiercer is still doing that for me. I'm interested to see where we go with this. Is Melanie alive? I don't know. She better be. She better be alive. <laughs> I, I'm i telling you, I'm a riot if they don't have Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> um, it, it, if she wants to become Alex's dark passenger... Wait, no, that's Dexter. That's Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love me some Jennifer Connelly. I have been a, a fan of Jennifer Connelly ever since the career opportunities days when no one really paid attention to her acting. But now she is an amazing actress. And, I know. Uh, I'm excited. Look. I hope the, I did read a couple of articles and the showrunners would not reveal if she was alive or dead, really. Just mm. that she was going to appear in this season. So let's hold out hope for as long as we can. <laughs> we will. We will be holding out hope that we'll have a return. Well, that has brought us to the end of our episode for this evening. I'm Steve. I'm Daphne. And this was Panels to Pixels, and we will see you on the next panel. Good night.